another temperature record has been set in Russia this morning. And also we're monitoring the prospect of a sudden stratospheric warming event. But let's take a look at the weather across the U.S. A great way to look at things is with the water vapor channel. Obviously, yeah, very wound up system there in the central U.S. You can see the warm conveyor belt feeding moisture and warmth up the Mississippi River. And around the other side, we have the cold conveyor belt. Can't really see that so well in the imagery, but it is represented by this comma head. And we also have the dry conveyor belt right there. That's working into the Oklahoma and Kansas area. And the polar front jet, well, just based off a rule of thumb, we would find it somewhere in this area right here. Let's take a look at that surface map. This is a great way to see what we're dealing with, not only the highs and lows, but the fronts and the air masses. And we've gone the extra mile here with the thickness. Many of our regular viewers have seen this time and time again, but that does help us outline the air masses. For example, the cold air, you can see that punching into Arizona and New Mexico, where they've got snow at this hour. Those are a few shots from the webcam at Timberon, southeast of Alamogordo in the Sacramento Mountains. Snow showers coming down with that very steep lapse rate back there near the cold core low. So wet cold core low? Yeah, there you go. It's over southeastern Colorado this afternoon. The tight gradients indicating where that polar front jet is that we talked about. So the axis is going to be kind of in there. This is best found up at 300 millibars, but 500 will pick that up. And of course, the surface system is going to be right out there ahead of that jet max with the cold front down to the south and the warm front out to the east. Classic pattern. Height falls right there supporting that cold air advection and height rises coincident with the warm advection. So we're going to find those steep lapse rates pretty much right in this area. The steep lapse rates are realized where you have warmer air at the surface. So it'll be a little bit more unstable down there, but up to the north, just enough instability to create some snow shower type activity. And then as you go further north, you get more into the dynamic lift. So out ahead of that, yep, shower storms all through the lower Mississippi River Valley up into Missouri and Illinois. Some freezing rain being reported up there, north of Topeka, and out around Concordia. North of that warm front, we do have fog. You can see the cooler temperatures there in the upper 50s, near 60 degrees. And down to the south, the 70s along the Gulf Coast. And with that strong flow, high surf problems. That's a look at the Gulf, around Gulf Shores and Orange Beach. Pretty much where Alabama and Florida come together. Some very beautiful footage. Wouldn't mind being down there right now. But further to the northwest, we've got that approaching frontal system. A broken area of storms at the sour. It looks to be a little bit on the weak side. The Storm Prediction Center does have a slight risk out for that area. And a couple of tornado watch boxes, the newest one, has been put out for northwestern Mississippi. Storm reports for today are scarce. Just a little bit of wind damage reported from Shreveport up towards El Dorado, Arkansas. And that's a look a little bit further up the line. Again, not very organized, but we do have this one severe thunderstorm warning out for southeastern Arkansas. Out in the western U.S., quite a change. We're starting to see some strong ridging all the way from the eastern Pacific into Nevada and Utah. So some improving weather in that part of the country. Still not really out of the woods. We've got another Bear Clinic system moving out of the eastern Pacific. That's it right there. Triple point just west of Fort Bragg and Arcata. However, if you look at the thickness lines, that does suggest a trajectory out of the west-northwest. So this is not going to be in training quite as much moisture, but it still will have some effects in northern California and in the Sierra Nevadas. Further up north, Good chunk of maritime polar air there off of British Columbia. That's indicated by the concentric circles right there, indicating the location of that polar air. 
and then further up into Alaska, still somewhat stagnant, some of the more severe polar air up to the north and to the west. And then we find the richer Arctic air out to the east, which has kind of been the theme over the past month. Minus 42 at Arctic Bay, minus 40 at Isaacson, and minus 42 at the very top of the map at Eureka. And elsewhere, lots of minus 20s. So that's the bulk of the Arctic air. However, that's not really coming south. You can see that the wind flow is mostly out of the east. Then taking it south into Canada, stagnant weather pattern. This high here is a little bit deceptive because this is a large area of low pressure. So we've got a gradient pulling warmer air up from the south. And as a result, that's a warm advection pattern. So a little bit of fog and cloud and some scattered snow here and there on the prairies. And out there in Quebec in the Maritimes, an active frontal system coming out of northern Quebec. It is much warmer up in that part of the province, but snow all the way from Newfoundland and Labrador out towards Ontario. Well, I didn't think we would be returning to Siberia already, but they have set another record. I don't know if any of you have spotted that, but there it is, minus 81. The city is indicated to be Jampa, but it's actually a town called Tangulak, and that was set early this morning, minus 81 degrees there. And that's the coldest record in Russia since, I think, 2002. Now, the all-time record is minus 90, and that was set back in 1933. But you take a look around the map, and there is a lot of cold air. Now, the most populated area is going to be right there at Yakutsk, and they're down to minus 66. So that's not near their record of minus 84, but... That is still pretty frigid. And you have to forgive me, we're working almost entirely in Fahrenheit here. I do know we have some viewers in Europe and that kind of thing. But, you know, we're going to use Fahrenheit here just to kind of keep things simple and avoid a lot of time-consuming conversions. But there's a look around the rest of Siberia. Again, Fahrenheit temperatures. That old station that set the record, they've warmed up nicely to minus 27 they were down at minus 80 back on the 10th. So that kind of shows you that some of that severe cold has kind of migrated south a little bit, very slowly. And looking down there at China, some extreme cold showing up in that region too. Minus 52 right there near the border of Manchuria and minus 40s all the way down this river. I forgot the name of it. And quite a lot of cold showing up out in this area too, minus 52. So, yeah, this, this is quite an event here. And before we finish out that topic, let's take a quick look at a few charts in that area. 300 millibars showing a segment of the polar vortex parked right over that basin area around Yakutsk. And you can see over the next several days, it gradually shifts down to the south. And that's probably going to take a lot of the cold air with it. Maybe not minus 80s and minus 70s but certainly some much below normal temperatures. We can also look at it on the 850 millibar chart, and I've got the heights and black lines, the temperatures and red lines, and the colored shading is also the temperature, and this is gonna be degrees Celsius. So Yakutsk is gonna be right in this area, and Tongulak, I think that's gonna be somewhere in here. I don't know exactly where, but it, it's certainly right in that area. And the core of the deepest, coldest air is just slightly to the south. And we can see over the next few days, that just kind of migrates down there towards Manchuria. And we can see warming up to the north. So a little bit of relief up there in northern Siberia. And there's a quick look at what surface temperatures look like in degrees Fahrenheit. Again, we have to find our areas of interest. They're going to be kind of right in there. I think Yakutsk was there. Anyway, you can see that there is some rounding. The model's not accurately capturing those minus 80s, but it does kind of show the geometry and extent of that cold air pretty much all the way out west to the Urals. And if we go forward and kind of track things, you can see it disperses down to the south. A little bit hard to see, but... It approaches that border area of China. That's where the Trans-Siberian Railroad operates. 
and they're going to get a pretty good taste of that air, and then maybe we'll see some moderation after that. Anyway, let's come on back to home and see what's going on. There is a bit of a buzz right now about a possible sudden stratospheric warming event. Let's take a look at early December. This is the temperature up at 10 millibars, which is somewhere up at, uh, I would guess, in the ballpark of 90 or 100,000 feet. But it is deep up there in the stratosphere. You can see a strong vortex there in the North Pole area. You can observe the large extent and the depth. And as we get into Christmas and then towards New Year's, there's a bit of a change. We start seeing an anticyclone developing over Siberia. You can see that takes root and the vortex itself out there in the northern polar region appears to weaken. And if we take a look at the forecast from the GFS, not too sure how accurate this is going to be, but it's all we have. It does point to that anticyclone building across Russia and eventually starting to dominate the picture across the north polar region. And you can see by the very end of the period, the flow is reversed across much of the northern hemisphere. But we still have a vortex out there over the Atlantic. It's not gone. It's just been displaced to the south. And because this has been kind of a gradual process, this is not really a sudden warming event, but it is a significant change from what we've seen over the past month. So since this stratospheric warming is kind of gradual and we're just in the early phases, we can't make any predictions about polar outbreaks and that kind of thing. You're going to see some of that on social media, but that stuff is really too early to call. And we're going to get better information from this hemispheric 300 millibar chart. So what do we see? Pretty much the same pattern we've been looking at for the past couple of weeks. A succession of troughs and ridges coming in from the Pacific. There's a trough, there's a ridge, trough, and so on. And they just kind of march eastward. We go forward through the GFS forecast sequence into Thursday and Friday. Another trough dropping into the southwestern U.S. Ridge building into the British Columbia and northwestern U.S. region. And the storm track takes aim more towards Washington and British Columbia. So that, with this region that we have right here, that's a huge change from what we've had this month. Going into Sunday and Monday, a lot of ridging on the west coast that continues. So this is kind of pointing to a long wave ridge setting up shop there in the western U.S. and troughing out over the eastern U.S. And you can see that wave dropping into the trough right there, deepening on Tuesday. And pretty much the same pattern going into Friday next week and, and into the 28th and 29th. So... This is a little bit more of a P&A pattern with a cutoff low off of California and northerly flow. That could bring some cold air into the central U.S. towards the 28th and 29th. A lot of that's going to depend on the volume of cold air we have up in the Arctic region and whether this ridging builds going into the final week of January. And this is one of my favorite charts. This is where I can look at the surface systems, the black lines indicating isobars, and the red lines indicating 1,000 through 700 millibar thickness. So those are kind of like the average isotherms in the lower part of the troposphere. So we can certainly make out that front there in Texas oriented somewhat like that. The warm front like that, you can see the thickness gradient up to the north of these boundaries and an occlusion going back into Kansas. Out there in the Pacific, there's a new warm front. There's another cold front. And it looks like the interval of these storm systems has lengthened a bit. There's the one coming onto the California coast right now, and probably about a good thousand miles out there to the next system. So we bring that forward into the Thursday, Friday, Saturday time frame. Warm front heading for British Columbia right there. And this system out here north of Hawaii is a little bit further south. So that normally would be a concern for California, but you can see it lifting right up north into British Columbia and deepening into a 968 millibar low. Meanwhile, in the U.S. over the weekend, 
Friday night into Saturday. High pressure covering much of the country. That's a double barrel high right there. Warm advection into Canada. Not much cold air coming south, just very localized up north in Nunavut. And because of that high pressure area right there in the central U.S., the Dakotas, Wyoming, that's going to feed a northerly flow down to the Gulf Coast and into Arizona and New Mexico. So it'll be a little bit cool in that part of the country. And that'll provide some of the cold air that we need for this system right here coming together in west of Texas. Now, where did that come from? Let me back that up. Very hard to see, but it looks like there's a little upper air disturbance right there. A little bit of bare clinicity. Very subtle. And that tracks right back to that system that we have off California right now. So let's bring that back to Saturday. We can watch that track across Texas and picks up a little bit of warm air advection right there. The main low located there cold front so it's a little bit similar to what we have today maybe a little bit weaker but looks like it does pick up some significant convection as it moves out there across mississippi and alabama so we'll have to watch for severe weather over the weekend in that part of the country so i'm preparing to wrap this up right now we'll check back in on that event we have today squall line about to cross the mississippi river but no warnings, so I think we're really lucking out with this particular event. And there's the nowcast graphic I have at the current time. This is going to be surface plots, potential temperature in red, and isobars in black. Let me get rid of some of this clutter so you can see it better. So we cut it back to just the isobars and the reflectivity, showing the troughing associated with the leading edge of the squall line right there, the meso high. Following in the wake of that, just showing a little bit of ridging, and the main cold front just to the west. And if we add the potential temperature, that shows the thermal field, and that appears to reflect the warm front, which is probably right in this area here. That can be an area where the wind field can be locally enhanced. And if we had our ingredients together just a little bit more. I might be looking for some enhanced severe weather right there. And by adding the plots, we can look at the dew points. That's going to be at the lower left of each plot. We can see the dew points are not terribly high. Looking at 64 right there, 60, 62. And when we have significant severe weather, those are typically towards 65 and 70. So the moisture field is lacking a little bit. Let's look at the high resolution rapid refresh forecast. And that basically brings a quasi linear complex of storms into Mississippi. So that's going to be about 8 p.m., moving pretty steadily eastward. And that's going to be midnight. So starting to enter Alabama right there. Now, to look for severe weather prospects, we can go to Pivotal Weather. I do like them because they've maximized the detail in some of these depictions of reflectivity. And if any of them are trending towards a more discrete structure, that would be pretty obvious. But I'm not really seeing that here. So I think the main threat is going to be maybe weak bow echoes here and there. Not very organized. And that'll be mostly towards the early part of the evening. And then you can see it kind of weakens as it goes into the early morning hours. And by dawn, not a whole lot left. And that's all we have for this edition of Forecast Lab. I want to thank our newest Patreon supporters, Lane Kirby, Walt Lowe, and Daniel Zeljak. Welcome, and thank you very much for that support. And thanks to our existing supporters, people like James Flanagan, Brian Haggerty, Tom Horn, Meet Puppet, Mark Inn, Bill Peterson, Brian Schrader, James Taylor. Thank you all very much for that support. And we'll be back on Friday for another edition of Forecast Lab. Hope you have a great one, and we'll see you soon. Bye-bye.